Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm so excited. Today I have Frederick Dotson, one of the greatest writers of all time. Without Frederick Dotson, there would be no Reality Revolution podcast. We owe everything to him and his deep explorations of consciousness, the law of attraction, and parallel realities. Frederick Dotson is one of the best writers ever, not just in a particular genre, ever, in my opinion. He is a prolific metaphysical writer who's written multiple masterpieces. My most gifted book on Amazon is Parallel Universes of Self, but I could easily give any one of Mr. Dotson's books and know in my heart that it would change someone's life. The Levels of Energy is one of the best books ever on energy and a system of understanding the different kinds of energy we are integrating and using. Prosperity Consciousness and Magnetic Wealth Attraction are master classes on money and how to change your financial mindset. Increase Your Energy, being, being Higher Self, Intuition Training, and The Lives of the Soul are all classics destined to be considered some of the greatest contributions in the study of consciousness ever. Uh, his books explore the deepest questions of the life of the universe and the soul. He asks deep questions and fearlessly finds the answers with no concerns about the topic that he's exploring. His books, Atlantis and the Garden of Eden and Ancient Aliens of Atlantis both contain doctorate level research on Atlantis. His book, Pleiades and Our Secret Destiny, is, is completely mind blowing. Uh, Frederick is a true spiritual explorer who writes fearlessly about everything from soulmates <laughs> to giants, aliens to angels. Each exploration is deeply researched. It is an honor to have you. I just want to thank you. As I was saying before this came on, your books have, have cert most certainly saved my life and helped advance my life on so many levels. So thank you so much, and welcome to the Reality Revolution. Well, thank you. I've never received such an enthusiastic introduction. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be part of the Reality Revolution. Well, we are very, very happy that you could join us. Um, there's lots of interviews out there, and we could easily, but I don't want this interview to just become like a lot of the other interviews. If people go on YouTube they can access a lot of the interviews. You talk about very fundamental concepts like the law of attraction and self-help concepts, you name it. You've pretty much covered everything. I kind of want to explore some different new topics. We, we, our time is limited. And if when people watch this years, weeks from now, time is not linear, send me your thoughts and questions now. We, maybe we can make this even better. Even if you're watching it now, this is all happening at the same time. And so, first of all, I... Uh, one of the most popular topics on the reality revolution is exploring parallel realities through our own consciousness. And there are, there's a, a small genre of books that have started to come out about that. Uh, Quantum Jumping, uh, Vadim Zeeland's Reality Transurfing. The first book that I read in this genre was Your Parallel Universes of Self. And it really changed everything for me. Uh, so I, I wanted to, to talk about that a little bit. And if you could just give a brief kind of an idea of how that came to be and, and how you started exploring the idea of moving through parallel universes as a, as a means to achieve goals and, 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 and experience, explore life. I think the parallel universes idea originally started uh, because I was interested in the concept of parallel universes to begin with as a science fiction concept at first. And then uh, later, later on, I read something that, that triggered it, which was how victims of multiple identity disorder uh, <laughs> could, could change their physical appearance or whether they're blind or not, or whether they're, um, they're rich or not, depending upon which identity they occupy. Okay, and in their case, it was a problem. And I thought, wait a minute, this could actually, changing that rapidly could actually be an achievement. Mm -hmm. So how could I use this knowledge uh, on identity shifting or identity switching and apply it to self-improvement? And that's when I started comparing it to shifting through different parallel timelines parallel universes, as if, as if you had different versions, okay? Today you're this version, tomorrow you're this version. Uh, when you're your husband self or your father self, you're different than when you're your business self. And as I began to study and experiment, experiment with that, I realized that who you are 
not what you want, but who you are determines not only what you see and notice and perceive, it determines what you attract into your life and what you're able to do. And I researched and researched, you know, and then I realized that statistically doctors are less likely to get sick, just as one example. Mm -hmm. I thought, why is that? They, they deal with sick people all the time, so they should be more likely to get sick. And I realized it's because of their identity, which says I'm the source of health. And if you're the source of health, well, you're not going to get sick. And that knowledge led me to achieving fairly effortless success myself, okay? Even though I love effort, I have no problem with effort whatsoever. And, and people will understand that when, when things become effortless, that you start enjoying effort. Right. So it's a weird paradox, okay? People who, who shy away from effort don't know how effortless things actually are. And I started to play the role, the identity, occupy the parallel universe identity of being a successful coach and an author. You know? And today I am. But originally it was just a, an idea that there's this parallel timeline with another version of me, but it's not the loser that I was, you know, the lazy guy that I was. Uh, he's a successful coach. He's this author. He loves people. He serves humanity. And, and I saw it. I saw this parallel universe. I identified with it, created it in the now, in consciousness. And it was in my heart long, long before it came true. It was already in my heart. And, and that's, that's the key to all manifestation. It's got to be in your heart today. All that matters is what's in your heart today. Success is today or there is no success, is what I say, because only success attracts success. So all that matters is the success you are today. There is no success tomorrow. That's an introduction to parallel universes of self. <laughs> Thank you. And so this idea is being explored in more and more, and people are trying to get into the consequences. The first thing I want to ask, some schools of parallel reality surfing are arguing there is only one physical manifest reality, that the other realities are kind of an information space. Uh, I don't think that there's proof by physicists yet, but what is your impression? Is there more than one physical parallel reality or does it matter? Well, the last question, does it matter, is a good one because I don't know if it matters in terms of self-improvement. Right. Okay. But, it, but it's, an, it, it's a beautiful... It's a beautiful idea to consider physical parallel universes because I always tell people they need to physicalize what they want to manifest, which means to act it out in daily life as best they can, to come as close as they can to the, to the physical. If you physicalize something and feel it and can touch it, it becomes more real. So I don't like to think, that's why I don't like to think in terms of it's just a vague information space. It might be true, you know, but right. it's, uh, saying that is, doesn't do anything for the person. I understand. <laughs> okay. Let me, th now, this is a question that, that I want to ask you. You talk about the, the law of correspondence and law of attraction in conjunction with this. Is the law of balance more powerful than the law of attraction? For instance, in reality trans surfing, the argument is that there's balancing forces for whatever actions that you take. You need to minimize those balancing forces. Those balancing forces are playing roles in which realities you move in towards and what you attract. So I've always wanted to ask you what the interplay between balance and attraction is in your opinion. I'm not all too familiar with trans surfing as much as I appreciate uh, the people who are into it and the, mm -hmm. the whole vibe of it. Um, but I apply balance in the, in, in, in the sense that um, it, actually I apply balance in terms of law of attraction. <laughs> right. um, if you, if you desire something too much, you subconsciously resist it, you subconsciously push it away, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And if you resist something, you subconsciously desire it. That's right. something new I, could, I might be able to share with many people. So if I resist something, I'm actually focusing on it. So the too much desire and too much resistance creates an imbalance that needs to be balanced out and neutralized. And actually, in my seminars, I te teach techniques for that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. without that balance, um, you know, you don't have a strong desire or need, you have a preference. You don't have a strong resistance, you just have a non-preference. Without that balance, you're not going to manifest much of anything. And I don't know if that's the same definition of balance that uh, trans surfers have. Um, would you like to define? The, it's very similar. There, 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 he's, he's using examples in nature of just how just water will go into balance. It will not, and just uh, the, the, the potentials, if there's a larger potential that, that, that nature will naturally try to balance it out. So they, in Transurfing, they talk about importance, reducing the importance, which I oh, right. think sounds exactly like what you just talked about. That, that, then that is exactly what I was just talking about. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Except that, you know, law of balance, law of attraction, it's, it's basically all just uh, energy, you know. It, exactly. it plays into the law of attraction. Uh, because attraction occurs when, rather than desiring it or overstating its importance, I just am it, right. then I can attract it. So the other transurfing concept that I'd love to get your take on is the idea of pendulums. The theory is that if multiple people are, are creating reality and attracting reality in together, there becomes a resonating informational structure that is almost a living in, in energetic entity that can pull us, that naturally feeds on our energy. Uh, political organizations, groups, media, even just two people can create a pendulum. And so there's a, it's, it's written by a Russian writer, it has a very Russian feel to it, and there's dire warnings. But the idea is there are these separate informational, uh, separate energetic entities that form when multiple people are, are thinking on the same resonant frequency. And so I've wanted to get your idea because you talk about energy a lot. And so what, what, what is your impression of the idea or theory of pendulums and how now, having me explain this to you, would you maneuver around these pendulums so they don't take you on, your, on the reality that they want to take you on or pull you into a, a timeline or a lifeline that, that is not meant for you or against what your soul's purpose is? Uh, I'd love to get your theoretical yeah, take on sounds, that. Yeah, sounds accurate to me. I think I call them waves, energy waves. Right. Uh, he calls them pendulums. And you mm -hmm. don't want to get swept away by the wave of others, you want to keep your own self and your own will and your own center. People get swept away easily by these, what you call pendulums, you know, and, and it's true that they, they gain a life of their own. They gain momentum and people get swept away in, in excitement. You know, that's how all of politics works. All of advertising works. Right. Um, and, and these pendulums are created. There's the, you can create them for the masses. That's why I always say there's no such thing as grassroots political movements. Uh, they're all artificially installed because these people know how reality creating works. And that's why the individual shouldn't get swept away too easily by this or that and should maintain their, their own vision, absolutely. And then I guess he calls them pendulums because eventually if the wave goes too strong in one direction, it's going to go in the other direction, the opposite, right? Right. If you oppose it, it gets energy either way is part of the argument that if you oppose Absolutely. the pendulum, you're still feeding it energy and that's what it wants. It doesn't care where it's getting it. Right. Uh, it, resistance creates the spin. Desire and resistance create, create the spinning energy and that's how it gains momentum. And, and you which you so talk about, your, you talk about that in your reality creation technique is finding that middle ground and trying, you know, mentally being able to accept multiple sides of something in a neutral observer type of role becomes a very powerful re reality creation tool in in your database. And 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 once I read that, I started to see it everywhere. That whatever attention I was applying, am I am I explaining that correctly? 
is the best I can. Okay. Expert, expert level, Brian, expert level. Well, thank you. So just one other question on the transurfing stuff, and then we'll get uh, two more. There, there's a, a new thing that people in the transurfing community are discussing, and it's related to energy. It's uh, the, the, the assertion that there is uh, something called a plat. Uh, and energy, we, we talk about chakras, and there's different level parts of the body that have energy. But there's an energy cord in the back of our head. You know, in yoga, they call it the bindu chakra. But it's where reality is streaming in, and then we can focus our visualizations to this particular area uh, and they have more power in shifting and p- choosing scripts and realities that we move into. And I was wondering if you, in your research, had read about something similar. I mean, I see references here and there, and I hear um, synchronicities, and I just wanted to get if you had, in your research, heard of anything similar in, in, in the law of attraction community or manifesting. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I use that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't see it as uh, personally. I wouldn't see it as necessary for myself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, the, the stuff I use is already sufficient. It is definitely so, very. You, you know, it's it's it's, it's sufficient. It, it's possible. It's possible because the cord, the um, astral cord mm-hmm. that you see when leaving your body, appears to come from here. Actually, this appears to be some kind of portal. Carlos Castaneda talks about it, you right. know, but it's, 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 it's yeah, right. It, which is, you know, you clap somebody here, but it's not something I've, I've seen as important and I could be wrong. Right. Now, but not personally. <laughs> okay. Well, th- thank you for answering. So going to identity shifting, which is one of the really beautiful things about parallel universes of self. Um, and, and it's really taught me a lot and you've obviously applied it in your coaching. And once you start teaching people identity shifting, what's the biggest mistake people make when they, when they try to do some, they try to shift their identity? They make it too far away from their daily life to that which is sustainable long term. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, so as you shift your identity uh, to the next higher version of you, as I say, you want to make it so that it doesn't overwhelm your daily life so that it's not such a far out practice that it disaligns with what's already going on with the momentum already happening. Um, going too quickly, wanting too much too quickly, getting mm-hmm. greedy, wanting, 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 you know. Um, it's a, a incremental, I, I recommend an incremental but steady and consistent lifelong improvement in those terms, not just quickly going up and then crashing. That's something I often see in new age circles, you know, mm-hmm. they, the seminar and they, they go really high and then they come back home and face previously created reality. Right. So you got to appreciate and accept the previously created in order to, to transcend it. You, you work with what's already there. You welcome uh, uh, what's already there. You appreciate your doubts and, and all that. You integrate them. And in spite of all of that, you gradually shift to higher and higher versions of you. You know, uh, for example, um, yesterday I bought a, a, a jet ski, first mm-hmm. time in my life. And... I could probably afford a jet ski 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, but, um, it's, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm just that way. I don't, I, I never waste money. I'm just that way. I, right. I, I, once I can afford 20 jet skis is when I buy the jet ski. Okay. I, I don't go <laughs> crazy. I'm, right. I'm, I'm slow and gradual and easygoing. Um, I'm gentle and patient with myself. And that's the biggest mistake I see in people. They get too excited, too excitable. You know, they get into externals. A jet ski is just something external. It cost me $15,000. Right. And even though I could have bought it, it was a dream of mine. I could have bought it 20 years ago. I didn't because um, it's not about externals. 
which is a common mistake to think it's about externals. It's about an internal state. You can have all these riches and all these externals, but that's not what it's about. And I train myself re to realize that's not what it's about by waiting 15 years or 20 years before I buy one. Okay. Um, people who know this don't, don't openly display their riches and don't like to do that. So people get too impatient, too excitable. That's why I keep telling them, telling, telling them it's about what you feel today and the seeds you sow today, never about what you reap. And I repeat that over and over. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most common mistake is wanting everything too quickly. You see, if you want everything too quickly, it assumes that you don't already have it. But in infinite consciousness, you actually already have it. And you want to enjoy it spread out on a timeline. So I wait 15 years for my jet ski. You know? I waited right. 10 years before I bought the car of my dreams. You, you want to enjoy, you don't want to enjoy everything at the same time. So when people come to me, why is it taking me so long for this to manifest? You know, you, you don't want that. You don't want the whole universe thrusted upon you today. Right. Uh, believe me, you really don't want it. You want to, you, you want to, explore enjoy and appreciate spread out you'd be totally overwhelmed if you knew that you already have everything everything right now right since you wrote that book and you've coached helping people move through parallel realities have you uh had any crazy experiences with your clients or yourself uh that you'd like to share with us crazy unusual Oh yeah, I filled I filled many books with with those uh, yes those experiences right absolutely <laughs> um, it, it's come to the point frankly it's come to the point I receive these emails all the time that I'm no longer impressed by you know because <laughs> guess what happened to me oh my god and then oh, a day later you wouldn't believe what happened to me and I'm just <laughs> oh, <God>. right. <laughs> Um, so you asked me the question, like, yeah, you know, whatever. Yeah, it, it does get crazy, but you want to be on a consciousness level where it's no longer crazy. I'm well, not, not saying crazy. to be as, as bored by it as I am, you know, yeah, whatever. Um, you want a million dollars, okay, whatever. But um, if it's that crazy and outrageous, that implies that you're not aligned with just how abundant you already are because you are part of the universe and the universe is crazy abundant. If you're like, oh my God, that's crazy. <laughs> well, it's not really crazy. It's normal. It's normal. Right? It's normal. So, what have I experienced recently that's crazy? Other oh, people I, would I, consider I, crazy, not necessarily you. We could say other people might say, wow, late, that's crazy. Late stage cancer reversed. Is that crazy? That's definitely crazy. Okay. It's not doesn't have to be crazy. I believe it, but it's still a wonderful miracle to 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 witness. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful miracle. Crazy, um, <laughs> helping somebody escape North Korea. Oh wow! Is that crazy? Wow. Yeah, that's 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 <laughs> enough for sure. So, so those, I, you see, I mentioned the things with heart because all these other things they're no longer that, that relevant. I get it. So, yeah, so, I understand. And I like the thing is, though. People, you know, the universe is so gigantic and big, you're connected to it. These things you can experience by, by birthright. It's, it, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're meant to experience your power, and you're put on earth into a state of powerlessness in order to test and develop and prove your power. That's the purpose of negativity and powerlessness. Wow. So, you are constantly researching and exploring, and, and I love that about your writing, this inquisitiveness that is found in all of your books. Is there anything that you're exploring now about consciousness, something new that you're exploring or doing that, or writing about that, that you'd like to share with us? Uh, yes, there are things I'm exploring all the time. Curiosity never ends, and no, I don't want to share it. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> I want it to be suddenly there in the form of a book perfect um see i had some other questions from the listeners that somebody wanted to ask how do you differentiate 
between fake spiritual gurus and real ones? Well, there's a lot of ways to do that. One of them is lack of humor. They don't have a sense of humor. If they're all serious, they're hiding something. Another is uh, instead of creating reality creators who are independent, they create followers. Instead of creating leaders, they create followers. You know, most people at a reasonable level of consciousness can, can smell them instantly. And, right. and the more in progress as a humanity, the, more, the less common these kinds of people are going to become, the more easily you see it. But some are really smart and deceptive, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to, you know, if you can question the guru, that's good. You know, these common things, are you allowed to question them? Are you allowed to uh, think differently or do something differently? Or are you allowed to be better than the guru in, in some things? Mm -hmm. you know, is, is it okay to be better than him or know something he doesn't know? In the presence of humor and humility and kindness, you probably have, and confidence, you know, you, you probably have somebody authentic and that's something to feel intuitively and it's easiest felt in personal presence. It's hard to feel online really because right. online you can do anything you want. It's easy to deceive. But when you meet somebody in private, you're going to feel it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you visit his, his house and, and there's a sense there. There's a vibe there. It's either creepy or it's boring or it's light or it's fun, you know. And, and but also by the fruits, by the students of that uh, guru, that's what I recommend. You look at the fruits, you look at what kind of people come out of that school, come out of that teaching, you know, are these independent, confident successful people or are they uh desperately dependent and helpless and <laughs> right so you, you see the long-term fruits and then you know that that's an excellent answer i appreciate that uh, somebody else wanted to ask you if there are secret ways we can enhance we can acquire superhuman abilities i know you kind of talk about that and sometimes you mention that the search for that is, is, is not a fruitful one, that it can happen naturally. But I'm asking for her. So if, if, if we have some way of acquiring superhuman abilities, do you have any suggestions? Well, the question assumes that you don't have them, you know. Yeah, very true. Um, first of all, and it usually comes from, from lack, the question, from not being happy, from feeling limited, um, as you say, we're born with these abilities. We, 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 we should, we have all of these abilities we're born with. You, you, you do have superhuman abilities, but not the way the ego thinks it does. Right. Not the way it's shown in Hollywood movies. It's a more, in a more subtle way, you have superhuman abilities. Okay. I, mm -hmm. I recommend my book, Parallel Universes of Self. So the process is more subtle. The changes are more subtle. But they are superhuman, as I just said, you know, mm -hmm. reversing cancer, for example, is, is, is kind of superhuman. Now, can you fly with your body? Well, um, if you want to fly with your body, you got to let go of your human identity because the human creation implies being in a physical body that doesn't fly. Mm -hmm. okay? So there, there's no limit to what you what you can do, no limit whatsoever, but within a context, if you want to create something, it's a limited context. Every creation is a limitation, okay? So you create, I am a human living on planet Earth. I am in a body. You create that, you focus on it, so you limit yourself to that. Without limitation, there's no creation. Okay, so you're asking me, what about unlimited? Well, sure, you can be unlimited, mm -hmm. but then you have to let go of limited, which is letting go of what you've already created. Right. A human doesn't fly. 
uh, but a superhuman flies. So in order to be a superhuman, you gotta let go of being human. And I don't know many people who uh, voluntarily let go of that because there's a lot of benefits to being human. You see, you come from superhuman, you want it to be this limited for right. certain training purposes. Because you're superhuman, you limited yourself this much to see if you could get out of this quagmire, get out of this, uh, this, this prison, you know, it's, it's like a game. So you're this uh, infinite being, and then you limit yourself into a universe, and into a galaxy, into a solar system, into a planet, into a body, into a family, into an identity, into beliefs, getting smaller and smaller. And then, then you're like, okay, now let's try to get out. That's the experiment on planet Earth. The experiment on planet Earth is not really, can I be a superhuman? Because that's where you come from. Okay. I appreciate that. <laughs> So coming from the United States right now, it's an incredibly divisive time and it's very easy to watch, just turn on the news at any time. And it's a lot of negative information that directly, if, if I put my attention on it, even for a little bit, the energy, it's maybe you understand what I'm saying. So how do we as reality creators deal with news, crazy news that's coming out about politics or whatever it is? Um, some of this is market oriented. But what, what strategies can we have to deal with the, the divisive nature of the universe that we're dealing with right now? Uh, especially well, why, well, why do people watch movies? For entertainment. Okay, and what makes entertainment? I guess it would be a feeling in, in many ways. Drama, right? Drama, Drama right? Yeah. Conflict. So they're purposely... So yeah, it's, it's a way of uh, news media and politicians getting attention. Right. Right? They, they create drama and conflict. I don't know if, if, if this divisiveness and conflict isn't artificially uh, right. sustained and created uh, just to get attention. And attention is energy. So like we said in the beginning, can I keep my attention with my life? And what I want to create, or am I going to give my energy to media and politicians fighting it out? You know, it's no different than watching a sports match, really. You know, who's going to win? Who's, what's the next move going to be? And you can get caught up in that. And it's just as much a waste of time as watching too much sports. It can be fun. It can be entertaining. But at the end of the, your life, what does it do for your development, your success, your business. So I could choose to watch the news and watch a political debate, or I could choose to work on my website. Two hours political debate or two hours working on my website. What's going to further my agenda, which is to bring higher consciousness to planet Earth? It's a simple question, right? Sure. So I'm going to switch off the debate and use that attention, that energy to work on my website. It's, and, and people have a hard time because it's so appealing, so appealing to get into the drama because they juice it, you know, and you want, you want to, you derive some energy from this juice, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if the more conscious you get, the more you want to invest it in something good, true, and beautiful, your vision, the vision you came to planet Earth, Earth with, the vision that's in your heart. All right. So I wanted to go a little bit into some does of that. Your, I'm sorry. Does that address the question or not? Absolutely. Perfectly. Thank you. That, that absolutely, for me, it does. Um, I wanted to, you have so many other books and so many, there's no way that anybody can properly inter interview Frederick Dotson. So, <laughs> but you have a, you, the books about Atlantis and, and levels of energy. And so I remember um, recently having read the, the law of one, a channeled work from the eighties that, discusses levels of density and Atlantis. And I was wondering if you had had a chance to, um, to, to read that book. Um, it's just, it's been recommended to me so many times and I never read it because I'm not no longer that big into channel books. I used to be in my early twenties mm -hmm. and people keep saying, Oh my God, you sound just like the law of one read it. Um, the thing is, I'm sorry. I haven't. And the thing is I don't read that much self-improvement understand yeah do it it's just amazing how this book which is basically a description of how the universe works is 
identical to what you're talking about. All of the universe is moving towards this higher energy, a thousand level energy of oneness and love, but that, 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 that we're moving through densities on the idea that the sun and the, and the planets are conscious too, and they're creating an error. It's just interesting. Um, but I, well, keep, I, people keep, people keep telling me about yeah. the book. I, I might as well read it. <laughs> well, there might, there, maybe there's a summary video that you can watch on YouTube instead of, but, um, okay. It was just a, a question. Now, uh, you have this un- unique interest in Atlantis, and the people that have read your books may have seen, well, Frederick Dawson wrote a book about Atlantis. That's not what he usually writes about. When you crack open one of these books, they're a little different than your other books because you did some very, very, um, you, you list out a lot of deep research, and you go beyond just uh, Google searches. You seriously went into the mythologies of different cultures, and so I was very, these were very interesting books. I, I'd l- like for you to talk a little bit about, uh, well, we can start at a basic level about uh, Atlantis and, and your, your beliefs about that. And maybe we can go a little bit further about that. Um, so Atlantis w- is basically mentioned by Plato. If I play the um, devil's advocate, um, people say, well, Plato's the only person that ever really mentioned Atlantis. When you read the Skeptics in- Inquirer, most of that is about, Plato being the only mention of it. And I'd like to, and there's been people, but uh, I'd like to get your argument for why there was an Atlantis and what the evidence gives and, and as best you can so that, you know, maybe we can entice people to, to read the book further. Well, the, the point of, of writing the book was to just uh, explore other stuff for a change because I've been doing reality creation for 25 right. years plus, you know. Um, it, it always interested me. I was always interested in ancient aliens, and I always had the sense that the way things are taught in school is, is not true for various reasons. And then I, I, I noticed that um, it's not only Plato, it's a lot of cultures that report of a civilization pre-flood. And then there was this gigantic flood and that great civilization fell. Mm-hmm. That's reported not only by Plato, it's reported in every single religion. It's reported in uh, ancient cultures from all across the, the globe, the Mayans, you know, um, the Aborigines. And I started collecting all of these stories. And I actually did that when I was a teenager. I only wrote these books 25 years after I, before right. internet was even a thing, okay? Mm-hmm. I, I wrote the books 25 years later. Wow. I thought, okay, you know. I still have this this idea in mind. And there's actually so much more to say on the topic. I might write a few more. I might not. I don't know. But um, it it appears like there was a high civilization before the flood. The civilization declined. Then there was the flood that destroyed it all. And then we had a restart, a fresh start. If, If you see history on a timeline... And, yeah, it took us about 2,000, no, 10,000, 12,000, 12,000 years to get back up to this technological level. Uh, But we'd have to get our consciousness up, too. Otherwise, the same thing is going to repeat again. Right. Well, it's very easily, Atlantis could just be shoved under another continent. I mean, I think I read the other day that they think an entire other continent is under Europe. So, I mean, uh, you, you give some good arguments for locations and, and things like that and make it very real and possible. It's very interesting. And then um, the, um, one of the cool things that you say that I love this, anything, science fiction has reality. That people, if you imagine something in science fiction, that there's a likelihood that that's a real thing. And I love that. I think that you said that in the Pleiades. So that means that there's Jedi and Sith and the Force out there somewhere in reality, I love this concept, the idea that science fiction has some credence because it's a part of the general imagination. Sure. You know, you got to explore. People have to explore. What is imagination? People don't ask the question, what is it? Where, mm-hmm. where do we get these ideas? Can you really imagine something that doesn't exist on some level? I, I really doubt it. Mm-hmm. To me, imagining, from my experience, actually, imagining is just putting your attention beyond what you see around you with your five senses, which is incredibly limited. Okay. So when you put your imagine somewhere, it's got to exist on some level. The idea has got to come from somewhere. 
it doesn't just uh, exist in a vacuum. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'd say yes, all, all of that exists. Everything that has ever been imagined does exist. What a wonderful thought. That just means some very cool stuff has been happening. It's, it's exciting. Yeah. It is it's very, very exciting. exciting. Yeah. Um, so uh, another quote, you, you wrote a wonderful book, Your Intuition Training and about intuition. When you go on Facebook and all the message boards and people talk about law of attraction, it's very popular. People talk about seeing 1111. Oh, I saw 1111. Um, and, and, and people are trying to understand the signs and coincidences around them. I understand the reticular activating devices. We are very good as humans at finding stuff we look for. Uh, so there's a part of our brain that naturally is going to find stuff we look for. How do we differentiate that something's a genuine sign that our, our spirit or higher self is wanting us to identify and something that's just a coincidence that our brain finds patterns with? The, do you understand the, the distinction I'm trying to make? Because yeah. you're, you're really good at talking about intuition. I've always wanted to know, how do I know that's a sign and that's not a sign? when I'm trying to understand these things that are coming in. So in general, um, if, if, if names and numbers keep matching, it's, it, it indicates a certain type of flow. You know, if you just get 1111 once on your, on your phone, what does it mean? You, you look at the time, oh, it's 1111. What does it mean? Well, it means whatever you think it means. Uh, but if, if, if you're in a certain flow, uh, this will be consistent. For example, for some time, all of my hotel rooms, I travel a lot, added up to the number seven or the number five, in fact. And then one day, that flow was broken after about two years of everything adding up to seven. Now, that's significant. Yeah. That's beyond mere coincidence, okay? Uh, if, if eight, nine hotel rooms in a row add up to seven, Mm -hmm. uh, or add up to five. And then one day it was broken by seven, and then I realized I left the five flow. Now, I'm still not sure what it means, but it's good to be aware of it because it allows me to see that everything is somehow, there's a plan to stuff. Everything is somehow connected to everything else. Okay, I'm still not sure what it means that, mm -hmm. that all of these hotel rooms added up to five over the years. But I do know that life is not random. Life is not um, a coincidence. That there's some kind of organizing principle up there going on, maybe on my behalf. And that's beautiful enough, you mm -hmm. know. So even though I don't know why that happened, I know it has a meaning. Now, in some cases, there's going to be it could be used as either a positive or negative sign as a warning, you know, a certain person approaches me with a certain name I've had bad experiences with before and asked me to do business with him. I'll think twice about it. I'll do my research before I do business with him. Mm -hmm. Or um, somebody asks me, um, well, should I marry this person? And I realize that their last names are, are Baker his name is Baker, and her name is a, from another language and means bread. Okay? It's Baker bread. <laughs> so, so I'll point that out. I won't say, you should marry because of that. That's superstitious. Okay? Right. Right. Uh, uh, but I will point it out. And that's the difference between being um, easygoing and being superstitious. If I'm superstitious, I'll say, that definitely means you have to marry. It's an open, <laughs> it's a sign. I won't do that. I'll say, well, isn't it interesting that uh, her name in another language means bread and your name is Baker? Maybe that's a hint. Okay. Right. So, so it's, it's in the way it's, it's approached. And a lot of people approach it in a really superstitious way. Oh, my God, oh, my God, it wasn't 11 of them, and they shouldn't go there. You know, it's fear-based. Right. It's fun and humor-based. So I'd say the difference is, are you using it with humor, as a cosmic scene, the cosmic joke, you know, that there's some kind of planner up there, or are you using it in a superstitious, fear-based way? I think that's the important question. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So another common topic amongst law of attraction circles is, and it's almost a pendulum or there's arguments about it, 
is the idea that you can attract a specific person. Uh, if I want to attract Demi Moore, then I can, if I, if I focus, I will attract Demi Moore. And then there's the argument that that is, that creates too much desire and there's imbalance, that it's impossible to focus on a specific person, that you should focus on a general person. You have a wonderful book about soulmates and love, and, and I wanted to get your perspective, in your opinion, can you attract, if you have somebody that you really uh, are attracted to and that you want to be with, can you attract that specific person, or is that going about it wrong? Should we try to attract somebody like that person? What is the best technique? You can attract Demi Moore, and it's no good to do so, is my answer. Okay. Um, so, targeting somebody specifically, you can do it, you can achieve it. It takes more energy, first of all. It's, la it's um, ego-based, second of all. You don't let the universe organize the right partner for you. You target that, you've got to be that person. Right. Uh, if you'd let the universe do the job, your higher self, your soul, God, whatever you want to call it, if you'd let that part do the job and get the ego out of the way, they'd send you somebody much better than, um, than Demi Moore. But the ego thinks <laughs> you've got to have Demi Moore, you know. Right. Who's, she's a basket case, but the ego doesn't see that. The ego doesn't see that Demi Moore is a complete basket case, okay? <laughs> complete nut case. <laughs> Um, alco former alcoholic, former drug addict, probably still drug addict, uh, sexually abused as a child. And, but the ego doesn't see that. All the ego sees is the glamour, you know. Um, oh my God, I have more. And then you put all this effort into it, and it is possible. It's extreme focus and effort, you know. But you also, you would have to change who you are. You'd have to go to the level of being a celebrity yourself, presumably. You'd have to become the person who is attracted to Demi Moore. And with lots of effort and effort, it would be possible. And then with all this ego effort, you finally achieve it. And after a couple of months, you'd be like, gross. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, so that's not the way I teach. Right. You can do it, sure, but that's not the way somebody much better for you if you don't go specific but intend the following and I say this in my book Parallel Universes itself I say this person the equivalent or better instead of just this person this person the equivalent or better or better perfect and, and another thing you talk about in that soulmates book is we don't just have one soulmate we can have multiple soulmates when you consider the multidimensionality of what we're talking about. Uh, some people are dead set. No, no, no. There's only one person out there that's meant for us. Uh, explain your belief that there, we can have multiple soulmates. Um, or am I, am I interpreting you incorrectly? I mean, uh, well, you, you have, you, you have, let's say you have, I'll, I'll make it more romantic for people. Okay. okay? You have multiple soul friends and one soul mate. Okay. Does that sound more friendly? Sure. That makes more sense. All right. <laughs> um, so I really so, want... So soul friends are the people you know from another existence and another right. reality, okay? And I just call them soul mates because you recognize them from another reality. But then there's this concept called twin flame, and that's what people mean by soul mate. Right matter of words being used. Mm -hmm. There's, there can only be one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a beautiful concept, okay? There's this twin flame. It feels good. It feels it romantic. Feels yeah. And I'm willing to believe it because it feels so good. Right. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite, I could, uh, there's so many books I could delve into, but I love the lives of the soul. You explore and ask questions that, a lot of people, surprisingly, are not asking what is going on with the soul between incarnations and the process of how we, how we acquire our knowledge back. And it's just a wonderful book, and it's just so exciting. It's like you're, you're giving the secrets of the universe a little bit there, and you have some incredible stuff. It feels genuine and authentic. 
how do you how do you research a book like that? You said at the beginning you kind of had some out of body experiences in meditation. So first, before we discuss it, I wanted to get an idea. That's a tough book to write because it's there's a lot of very deep and information. So, what was the process in writing that book where you explored what happened with the soul first? Yeah, the, the book has to be about eighty percent experience and then twenty percent research. Right. And research also means reading all the books on it that are on the market, you know, I, and I actually do that. If I'm interested in something, I read every single book there is on it. Right. Uh, but if it's only that, people are going to feel that. They're not going to be inspired. They'll know it's just intellectual. It's not experiential. Mm -hmm. So the trick is to only write what I myself have experienced. People keep saying, Fred, can you write a book about this, a book about that? Well, I could, but I haven't experienced it. So it's, you know, it's, it's not going to have an impact. It's going to be in the mind. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I went through it. I saw it. I felt it. But there were still a few blind spots for me as to what happens in between lives. Right. That's where research came in. And there's really no way of saying whether how accurate that right. research is, it's a difficult topic to write about because it's, it's to the mind, to this existence, it's vague. It's hard to see. Okay. So that's why it's short. It's a fairly short book. I think mm -hmm. it's only uh, 150, 200 pages or so because I didn't want to venture too far out into stuff. I don't know. Right. Okay. Right. I, I only wrote what I'm, almost certain of almost certain right okay and the stuff i'm vague about i just i just put it aside so i'm i'm certain that there are lives between lives and i'm pretty certain that it, it's um there's different densities and levels of being and consciousness levels of heaven levels of hell different planets you can incarnate into different universes different dimensions but you name it they have it it's it's all there so I could leave my body, could go reincarnate on earth. I could go to a heavenly plane. I could go to a hellish plane. I could incarnate into another planet. Mm -hmm. People are too limited. They're like, okay, either reincarnation exists or heaven and hell exist. You know, it's, it's way too limited. The way people think is just right. limited. It's not true at all. None of this is true. The truth is that the infinity is so gigantic, you could get lost for billions of years in some other universe before you return and realize, oh, okay. <laughs> Which is what's happened to us, you know. You right. can go from universe for billions and billions of years, you know, and then who am I actually, you know? What's, what's my origin? What's what source? And, and then you finally go back to source. Um, and, and these games are played, and it's fun. It's a playground. It's no different, really, than... On Earth, you can travel to many types of places, and most people living on Earth haven't even traveled 1% of the places they could travel. Mm -hmm. and, and all of that is out there as well. It's a matter of choice, actually. That's why it's good to consciously choose um, what vibration and, and thing you're into. You know, I'm into lightness, love. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what I'm into. <laughs> well, you had said your goal is to raise the consciousness of humanity. Uh, so a simple question is, how can we do that? How can, what, what, what process can we go through to raise the conscious? Can, can I help in raising humanity in general? Uh, I can do a little bit through me, but what, what can we do to raise the consciousness of humanity? Well, first, first you raise your own consciousness, you improve yourself, mm -hmm. and then you serve others. So after I had achieved all that I wanted, which was, I was about 32 years old. By that time, I could say I achieved it all, seen it all. Uh, you want to serve. and You, you want to serve people and help them along. You see the, the lostness of humanity, the confusion, you know, the, mm -hmm. all these contradictory beliefs and information, and you just want to help them along to succeed first at a material level. That's why I call myself a success coach. And then once they're fed up with the material money success thing, um, they start looking higher. You know, what's, what else is out there? And you want to help them along with that. 
So first you improve your own consciousness and then you serve, which is exactly what Brian Scott is doing, you know, with his website, and videos, and all that. You're doing it already. I'm trying. All right. Oh, you're absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely doing it. Absolutely useful. The world needs much more of that because that is so still, even though there's supposedly so many teachers out there, it's still kind of lacking. You know, it's not present right. in universities. It's not present in mass media. It's not present in adult education. Um, and because it's not present there, we need more people like you. And like uh, you. Yes. Developing it, thinking about it, exchanging about it, you know. Perfectly. Now, as a writer, just this is probably a very personal question. The thing that amazes me, 25 books in, and clearly you're very well read. You've read all these books of, of self-help books. How do you get to that point? First of all, I'd love to know your, your workflow, because it seems like you write a new book every two months, but, uh, and it, which is amazing. But one of the hard things when you write in this particular genre that you do is how to get, find your own voice. It's easy. Well, I remember so-and-so said that, and Joseph Murphy, Murphy said that, and it's easy because it, some of this stuff is so simple to always just, um, so how, how is it, and you do it so well, how, will you, how do you take, get rid of all that stuff and find your voice? Is my question making sense? Because yeah. it's something that you do well, and I'd love to, to know your process in, in writing process. as just a writing question. Yeah, well, that comes from me being, being bored by all these books, by reading them all and being bored by them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not wanting to sound that way, right. wanting to find my unique voice uh, to make it a bit more provocative, a bit more edgy, less watered down, which is why I self-publish now. I used to not, but now I self-publish right. because then there's no censorship. It's just no raw, just the way I am. You know, these, these publishers, they always wanted to water down my work. You know, oh, that's a bit too uh, this, a bit too that. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, you you want to you, you wanna feel what you don't like about all these books, okay? And if you see something you don't like about them, it's because within you, something better. You go with that. You go with what's, you know, Brian, you've probably read books where you're like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, of course. Of course. Right. Yeah. That's because within you is, is the next better version of, oh, okay. of that. Okay? That makes sense. You're, you're, you, the attitude needs to be like, um, we can do better than this. I'm, I'm kind of obsessed, you know? I'm like, um, yeah. I write an article and I'm like, you know, I write 10 articles, don't publish them on my website. Then I delete nine of them and only publish one. I mean, you've written that, entire books. Yeah, I think that's how I do it. I write like ten times more than I actually publish. <laughs> well, you wrote you wrote just, a book about a cult. You said in one of your that you just threw away because I mean, you wrote an entire book about a specific. You didn't say which one. Yeah, right, right, true, yeah. true. And you just threw it away. Yeah, you didn't want. Yeah, it doesn't excite me. It doesn't heal people's hearts. It doesn't right. touch anyone. Um, it does nothing. I, I, I just. I'm, I think the secret is I'm hard to impress and I don't even impress myself often. Right. Okay. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, it's, I can do better than that. We can do better than that as a humanity. Mm -hmm. We can do better than that. Even better. It's not perfectionism. Okay. It's just uh, feeling the quality of something. And if you're bored by it, you discard it and you think, what would I really be fascinated by? Because your fascination means it comes directly from your soul. Right. Um, you're fascinated by it. And if you're fascinated by it, your writing is going to be easier. It's going to be easier to write. It's going to have a different flow. It's actually going to become fun. And when it becomes fun, there's a spark in your writing, and that spark is going to go on to the people who read it. And they'll be reading like this, you know. Like, uh, like I read you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you, uh, here's, I, I can summarize that in a much easier way. Find the wow feeling. Just follow my heart and when I feel that wow feeling. Yeah. The wow feeling. The wow, okay. It's the wow feeling. All right. Wow. A couple more questions. If I got still a little bit of time here. Um, uh, what, what is your morning routine? I, I, I think you've even mentioned in some books, sometimes you don't meditate, but 
uh, have you have you put together a morning routine that works for you? I'd love to know like when, what time you wake up and what your general routine is in the morning. None really. You know, okay. I have breakfast. My morning routine is to eat yogurt and nuts. Um, unless my wife uh, makes something, which she rarely does. But if she does, I don't have... If my wife doesn't make anything, I just uh, make myself nuts and yogurt. That's my morning routine. I take a shower most of the time. So it's as normal as it gets. <laughs> no complicated energy exercises or meditations or any, anything like that. Okay. No, 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 no gimmicks. All right. The final yeah. thing I wanted that we haven't talked about a, a, as much that the Pleiades book is, is look, amazing. Yeah, look, just to talk to that for a minute. Sure. Um, I, it depends on your level of consciousness. Okay. The, the higher you get in experience and genuine consciousness and energy, the less effort is required to maintain it. The only times I start doing regular disciplines is when I start declining. That's how I get myself back on track. Okay. If, if I see my life declining, my health declining or whatever, I'm straight back to discipline. Wake mm -hmm. up in the morning, do this exercise, do that exercise. So I don't want to mock these exercises. It depends right. upon right. where you are. Okay. I, I accept that. It makes sense. And so just, uh, I was talking about the Pleiades book and I wanted to, before um, time runs out here, um, you explore the, the possibilities of different dimensions and, and aliens uh, having an effect on the growth of, of the planet. Your particular stories for you are absolutely unique. And if we had time, I'd love to explore them. And, and I, I recommend everybody read the book, Pleiades and the Secret Destiny. Do you think that the aliens will make a, an appearance that, everybody will know or was it always going to be behind the scenes or subtle or do you think there's going to be a point in the near future where we're, the aliens i mean we're starting to see unidentified flying objects but you think there's going to be a point i mean uh, uh, there's no for sure answer but i'd love to know your your thoughts or impression on that i think that point will come when people are no longer that no longer see it as that important uh, <laughs> when the consciousness hard. level is that high right okay and the point will come that might so, be a little while that might we might not yeah see that's going to be here. a little while people are too excited right now they're not ready for it it's shocking you know most people are i mean there's a lot of people who there's a lot of people who wouldn't be ready for it who couldn't process it and as long as that's the case, it's not going to happen, right. you know. But individually, uh, you can have it happen, not on a mass scale, but individually, you can, you know, see it or make contact or whatever. So you're not really dependent upon what everybody else is experiencing. Right. But the fearlessness of that book, as you even mentioned at the beginning of the book, hey, if I write this book, a lot of people are going to put me in this, in this separate category but you're fearless in your writing and you talk about some really unique experience, your first sexual encounter, somebody coming and taking your blood and the implications of this. It's pretty amazing. Uh, did you want to talk any, any further about it or should we just recommend everybody read the book? Is that probably the best place to, 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 to leave it or, or do you want to talk any further about that particular book and anything? Well, um, it, it was a very quickly written book because of the experience I had. It's just based yeah. on an experience. Right. Okay. And that's why I wrote it so quick. I thought, oh, I got to write all of this down before it fades away because higher consciousness experiences, super high consciousness experience, the mind tends to forget. And then after a while, right. it fades away. And you look back and did that really ever happen? <laughs> nah, you know, I must have right. been dreaming or something. So I wrote it right after the experience, uh, the encounter. I, I had an counter yes. these uh, beings these blue skinned beings and uh, it came then from this experience it recontextualized earlier events from my life and that was the most amazing thing ever I saw things I thought I knew about in the past in a completely different light then I realized that my first sexual encounter, you know, which I thought was just a sexual encounter, may have been something else. 
And then I saw that my experience here at the airport in Tel Aviv may have been something mm-hmm. else. So if, you're, if you temporarily ascend in consciousness, as I did with this contact with these beings, you suddenly see everything completely differently. And that's the yeah. beauty of the book. So I, I wanted to share that with people, and I wanted them to see reality in a similar way and to tell them, look, if you raise your energy level in consciousness, you're going to see everything that's ever happened to you in a different light. That is fun. What yes. if there's yeah. much more to you and much more to your life? Right. Well, the best thing I can, way I can describe your work is you've, you've opened up infinity to so many people. And that's what you've done with me. And I'm eternally grateful for uh, allowing this interview. I, I know you're usually very busy, so thank you for this, in, this interview. It's, it's been a joy to talk with you and uh, to get to talk well, to one of my heroes. So thank you. The funny thing is uh, an assistant of mine brushed you off. Okay. Totally understandable. Uh, 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 but the funny thing is that I discovered because somebody tagged me, I discovered this conversation you had on Facebook that you really wanted to interview me. And I thought, yeah, sure. Why not? If you want, you really want it that much, you know, what's the problem? Right. So you kind of manifested that even though you were brushed off, you kept wanting it, Mm -hmm. right? You kept focusing on it. So, so that's, that's your manifestation. Uh, This interview is definitely an, an example of the mechanics of manifestation. I let it go, but I still was hopeful. It wasn't right. super important, but right. it was something that I would be fun and joyful, and right. it worked out exactly so. So I really hope that I get a chance to talk with you again in the future, and I will definitely go to the next seminar that I can find. I hope I can meet you in person, and for you know, thank you for, for saving my life and improving my life in so many ways. I say thank you for all the other people uh, that have read your material and, and you have affected them. I thank you for them. And, well, uh, thank you for doing you, the work you do, okay? Thank you, because uh, it, it serves humanity more than, than you can imagine, um, possibly. Maybe you can imagine it. But, well, um, I, I, I understand and imagine more about what, how my work can affect humanity through you than if I had been doing it myself. You, you have definitely been my inspiration in doing this and, and some of the knowledge I've gained, and in, in, in so... Uh, I, I will definitely be cons- discussing your principles for infinity through my podcast, um, through other podcasts and other lives, and, and, and I'm sure. And so <laughs> I'm sure we will meet again in, an, in other lives and other incarnations. I, I, yeah. Before it's too late, I better ask. I wanted to ask you about time travel. One of the coolest things about Parallel Universe of Self, you talk about in meditation being able to go back and change events in the past. And I've created some meditations around this concept. Um, and I've had people say that that's ridiculous and it doesn't work. But your, your concept of time, nonlinear time, have you had experiences where you were able to change your past? Or had clients change their past? Or is it, is it more of a therapeutic instrument to let things in the past go? Or did they actually see reality shifts that occurred through changes that you make in the past? You make an interesting argument in the book. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> the funny thing is I, I apply it with people, you know, and then the changes occur, but rarely do they ex- ascribe it to, the, to, to, to that. The, the, the mind is a tricky thing, you know. Right. Um, yes, it does. If, if you change your memory of the past, you change your timeline, you change your feeling, of course that ex- that affects what you experience now. Now, some would argue it's only on a mental level. You're not actually changing the past. But then I would argue, um, what is the past? Right. Other than, than a thought. Other than the a past, past is a thought. Right. Okay. The, there's no such thing as the past. Well, the thing so, I, I had a near death experience. Somebody tried to, you know, to shoot at me, and, and I'd survived. And I was wondering, going, did I? Can I go meditate now and go and warn myself? What, what happened. And so I did that, you know, remembering your meditation. I said, I'm just going to, just in case, because I remember kind of felt like I had been guided and I remember, okay, I'm going to go back and remind myself that I, the things I need to do to survive this, this incident that had occurred. And so uh, I, don't, I, I just, it was one example. It's something that I pulled from the book. So it's interesting to get your, 
get your word on that. So, well, thank you so much, Mr. Dodson. It's, it's been a true pleasure and I hope to talk to you again soon. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.